Welcome to the Albany Book Festival Online, presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. You can learn more about the festival and find direct links to independent booksellers at our festival webpage, albanybookfestival.com. Follow us on social media and hear for more videos from the Writers Institute. Welcome to the third annual Albany Book Festival. My name is Paul Grondahl. I'm the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. As you can tell, during the pandemic, we're not able to do the usual on-campus in-person version, but we are uh, doing our best with this virtual book festival. We're very excited to have an acclaimed children's uh, author and illustrator, uh, author and illustrating uh, 18 books at this point, uh, Matthew McGillicott, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to mention that all of these interviews will be archived on our YouTube channel, so come back and take a look at NYS Writers Institute on YouTube, our website, nyswritersinstitute.org, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So Matt, it's wonderful to have you, but this is a strange time. You have a new book out, Don't Eat the Game, which we're going to talk about, but normally you'd be out in bookstores and probably doing school visits. How are you doing in this pandemic and, and how do you get a book launched during this time? <laughs> you know, Paul, I was really hoping you could tell me because <laughs> um, I'm totally at sea, like I think so many authors are right now. Um, to have a book launched in the middle of a pandemic, um, a, a picture book is a strange thing uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, it, you know, maybe the first is that it just feels very strange to go out and, and promote something and say, please buy this, when everybody has so many other things on their mind right now. Um, and typically, you're right, what I would be doing is going out and visiting schools, and I would typically visit 30 to 40 schools a year um, in person and speak to kids in giant auditoriums, and none of that is going to happen this year. Um, none of it so that also you know is a big part as most children's book authors will tell you those visits are a huge part of book sales as well right so yeah, yeah I, might, I might do a book signing at a at a bookstore and sell 20 books or 30 books right i might go to a school and sell 200 to 300 books right and that scale is totally different so well, through, through uh, all of the authors that we feature at the book festival, we're, we're putting direct links uh, to order books through our, our local independent booksellers, uh, Bookhouse of Stives and Plaza, and Market Block Books in Troy. I know you're, uh, you're friends with Stanley Hadsell, who runs that wonderful independent bookstore. So you're also a professor and, and the chair of art and design at Russell Sage College in Troy. I'm interested do, do those two, you know, teaching college students, uh, you know, interested in becoming artists and doing your own illustration and, and artwork for your children's books, do they intersect or are they totally different kind of practices? Uh, they, they definitely intersect um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, well, for one thing, I, I teach illustration courses. So um, what I'm doing professionally directly relates to what I'm doing in the classroom. Uh, but I think there's, there's a lot of other intersections as well. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, writing has helped me become more clear in my communication and more direct and more concise. And I think that's definitely helped uh, as a professor in the classroom. Um, and then, I, you know, I think the impact on students occasionally i'll have a student who goes out and has and i'm sure you've experienced this as well with your students where you don't even realize maybe something you're saying is having an impact and then next thing you know a year or two later you hear from them and uh, uh i just got a wonderful note from a student who graduated a year or two ago who's now uh working as a designer at uh, penguin putnam Oh, that's great. And, um, <laughs> you know, working with the same people that I work with uh, as, uh, you know, for my editors and art directors for my books. And to see that path um, is just so gratifying. It's amazing. That's wonderful. 
So when we were having uh, the live in-person book festival, we always had a, a children's literature room and it was the funnest, liveliest, noisiest. I keep circling around our campus. We have 5,000 people normally on campus and I always love going to that children's room because kids have so much energy and, and, and they're so unfiltered and things. I want to talk about your book, Don't Eat the Game, because it seems like you're, you're sort of uh, uh, giving a nod or a throwback to board games, which, you know, they're, they're sort of having a resurgence during the pandemic. Kids are, are normally always on their screens, but now these board games are kind of coming back. Talk about what you see, what, what's the value of a board game, and why did you want your book to kind of relate to that, you know, multiple players and things? Well, the book, um, let's see if I have one here. Uh, so the book is about a girl who, who gets a new game and doesn't have anyone to play with. Right. And she's an only child, and, and I was an only child, and uh, experienced that quite a bit. You know, a well-meaning family member would, would give me a board game, and I'd be very excited, <laughs> and then take it out of the box. And, and, you know, the first rule is this game is for two or more players. Yes. And so now you have to find somebody to play with. You have to, you, you have to sort of navigate that because it's something that isn't going to work alone. And so this book is, is a lot about her journey to do that, uh, her disappointment about finding that uh, she can't play this game alone uh, until a monster, a curious monster, shows up at her window uh, and asks to be let in and wants to join the game with her. And things sort of take off from there. Right. Until I think another experience that I think any child can relate to is uh, inviting someone over to play a game or to play with your toys, and then they don't really respect the rules. They don't behave. Right. It's, this monster invites more of his friends over. They take over and then pretty soon end up running off and stealing the game. And she has to figure out how to respond to that. Right. Um, it, it strikes me in, in the design and layout a little bit of an homage maybe to like Candyland or Shoots and Ladders. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's many years ago that I played these games, my, my kids are grown. Did you play board games? I know you have a, a son. Did you play board games with your son or? Oh, sure. All the time. Yeah. And I, and I, um, I did find friends to play with me when I was growing <laughs> up as well. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, a, a lot of board games and, and, you know, there's something uh, there's something about a board game, which is that the game is, is really all about the rules, right? Right. And so what makes the game fun is all the things that you are not allowed to do. Right. Right. You, you start with this premise, you can do anything. And now you buy this game and you set it up and you all agree to play it. And you all agree to say, we won't do this. We won't do this. We won't do that. And that's ironically where the fun comes from. Right. And there, there's a lot of, uh, mayhem that takes place in your book uh, eating parts and i can remember this from the kid like kids would get upset and throw the board and there go the pieces right. and, and 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 uh you sort of bring that in, in in wonderful ways i also saw a little bit with the monsters was that at all it seemed a little bit of reference to maurice sendak uh, who, who died a few years ago were you a oh, maurice I think I lost sendak fan at all of course, uh, who isn't a Maurice Sendak? Um, yeah. Where the Wild Things Are is the classic of picture book literature. Right. Um, I do a whole thing with my students just sort of deconstructing that book and how it's designed and the relative size of the pictures on each page and how they match the story arc that Sendak is telling throughout. It's, it's really beautifully designed. Right. Yeah, the, the monsters are definitely a nod to that and they're also, um, they're also meant to sort of mimic the game pieces. So they're all different colors that match the, the colors on the board right. and the game pieces. And what is it? I mean, monsters obviously is just a metaphor. Do you think children often have these fears or is it some kind of, you know, trauma? Or what do you see as the monsters standing in for? Um, I, I think those are all accurate, what you just said. Um, in this book, the monsters are there for, for a different kind of reason. When, when I did the first draft of the book, uh, it wasn't monsters who showed up at the window. 
it was wild animals. There was a bear, there was a raccoon, there was a porcupine. They were living in the woods outside her house and they invited themselves in. But there is another character in this story and that's the dog. Right. And the dog ends up playing a very important role. Right. And um, what we found when I discussed this with my editor was that um, we couldn't make sense of why the dog would behave a certain way and these other animals would behave a different way. It was kind of like the, um, in Disney where um, you have Goofy and Pluto and they're both dogs, but they both seem to live in different universes. Right. Um, so the one way to solve that was to make the creatures that come in the window completely different. And making them monsters um, meant that they could, they could be independent of the world of the girl and the dog and they could just stand in for these emotions and these, um, these fears or the anger or the selfishness that uh, children feel. Right. And, and this seems like very, you know, heavy on illustration and, and drawing, but I, I follow you on Instagram and you do a lot of really interesting computer generated moving. Do you blend, you know, computer techniques with sitting at a, drafting board or how, how did you, what was your practice in, in creating this book? Well, this book was created entirely on an iPad. Okay. Um, and uh, we had a family member who was, um, who was not feeling well, who was ill and who was in the hospital. And so uh, I wasn't able to work in the studio a lot. And having the iPad meant that I could sit there wherever I needed to be at that particular moment in time and continue to work on uh, making this book and designing the book. Um, and really the, that line between working digitally and working traditionally has become so blurred now. Mm -hmm. When you can hold this tablet in your hand and you can sketch with something that feels like a real pencil uh, on something that feels like an actual drawing tablet, a, a, like a sketchbook, right. um, it's really, you know, it's uh, the, in the old days, the distinction between working digitally and working by hand felt like there was a much bigger chasm between them. Right. But now they, they really blend pretty seamlessly. And this book from beginning to end was designed on the iPad. Wow. So how about your students today? Today, do you still actually require them to, to know how to use traditional metal uh, materials and mixing inks and paints or whatever? Do they, you let them do it all on their iPad or their tablet? Well, no, it's a mix of both. So um, actually this semester I'm teaching a, a drawing course, which is entirely traditional. Students are using char uh, charcoal and pencil uh, on paper and newsprint. And then I'm also teaching an animation class, which is entirely digital. And they're drawing with tablets and they're uh, using some really interesting high-tech stuff. Do you think you lose anything in, in shifting to digital or is it all upside with faster speed and easier to edit and? I think so, but I, I do think there are things you lose, but I think they're the same things that you would lose when say a writer might go from writing longhand on a piece of paper to using a word processor. And to me, part of what's lost is um, that sense of, committing to something when you put it down. So when you work digitally, whether you're writing on a word processor, or you're drawing on a tablet, undoing that mistake is just command Z. Right. There it goes, you're, you're done. Nothing really, nothing is really substantial. Right. But when you take out a pen and you write a paragraph on a piece of paper, you're committing to something that if you choose to cross that out later, you need to edit it or move things around, there's a cost to that. Yeah, I went through a lot of whiteout when I was starting with manual typewriters and nobody liked to revise. And, and uh, I, I agree with you that revision is, is what makes something great and multiple, multiple revisions even better. And, and that wasn't in traditional way. I don't think that always happened. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about don't eat the game. Sure. Uh, when you say picture book, I know, you know, children's literature has sort of well-defined parameters. So what ages or grades is this book geared to? I would say this would be anywhere from, I would say three to six, three to seven, somewhere in there. Let's say 
kindergarten through second grade, somewhere right. in that range. And so it's it's often meant for a, a, a adult or older sibling or something to be reading it to, or is this to, to let children, you know, their first readers kind of thing? I think picture books are often transition books. Yeah. So um, these are books where somebody can, for example, read to a child, and then if that child wants the book reread, um, they start to anticipate what's happening next. They right. start to predict, they start to pick up the words. Um, and any, I think any adult who's ever had this experience of reading to a child a book over and over again will find that the child will start to anticipate what happens right. and correct the adult if they should happen to read a line wrong. Exactly. Um, so it becomes this sort of transition in between. This book was actually first written as a wordless picture book. Oh, okay. So the very first draft with the animals coming in, there were no words at all. It was meant to be done entirely. You read it like you were following the spaces on a board game. That's kind of how it's laid out. It's a little bit of almost like a graphic novel in that way. You go from panel to panel to panel, right. but each panel is meant to mimic your progress on this uh, game board, which is your progress through the story. And I finished it and um, it, it worked, but it was clearly missing something. There was, there was I'm, I'm sure you've had this experience where right. it, everything feels complete. You, you check the list and it's got the characters and it's got the conflict and it's got the resolution and everything is there, but it's, it's somehow, it's missing that extra little something. And so I, I decided to rethink the idea of um, giving this text and having a story go with it. And the first story draft that I wrote was terrible because what I was writing was just mimicking what was going on. Yeah, in you want to add another layer to it. You don't want to just say exactly what the picture says, right? Yeah. Exactly. And and so I, I you know, as as so often happens, you have to write that awful first draft to sort of understand what's wrong and what to do next. And and in writing that, I realized. I was given this gift. At first, I was very frustrated because I couldn't figure out how to supplement this with words. And then I realized that, that this was really a gift, that because the story worked visually, the words didn't have to carry that weight anymore. The words could do something entirely different and they could run in parallel with the story, but they could also, they could say something that was directly contradicting what we were seeing in the image. And right. in that space, uh, between what we're reading and what we're seeing, uh, that's where the real story can live. Right. So the idea came to see if I could write the whole story. And the whole story in this book is nothing but the rules for the game. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no other text other than the rules of the game. Um, so like here we see the girl is just uh, uh, in the first page. She saw this is a game for two or more players. It is easy to learn. And we see the dog leaving. And we'll bring you hours and hours of fun. And clearly the girl is pretty dejected at that point. Right. So there's that, that nice contradiction. I think for a new reader, that opens up um, the possibility of uh, some avenues for discussion between right. a parent and a young reader. Now, I know uh, the, the parameters are fairly well defined in picture book or middle grade or young adult. So how many... Uh, illustrations or pages and how many words are sort of that picture book length it's it's pretty short there's not a lot of words right, right. well the 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 real defining length is the page length and that comes from um, restrictions on the printing process so uh, picture books are the vast vast majority of picture books are exactly 32 pages okay uh, generally when you get anything else other than that it will be some multiple of eight or 16. So you might go to 48 pages or 64. But by and large, nearly every picture book you pick up will be 32 pages, which is, as a writer and an illustrator, a really interesting box to have to work within. It's right. a really interesting challenge because right. sometimes I'll have a story that feels like it needs 34 pages or a story that feels like maybe it really only needs 30. Um, and then you sort of have to, 
challenge your assumptions about how the pacing should go and, and how the text should flow uh, to make it fit exactly in that box and land at exactly the right time. Right. Um, probably about, I think my picture books, they depend, but they usually come in around a thousand words, maybe a little under, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range. Yeah. So when, when you do a school visit, and I know you go to book festivals and things too, what are you doing? Um, I saw some nice pictures on your website. You're down on the floor, all these kids around you. Are you kind of reading the book or telling your story or showing how you draw? Or, I mean, Well, I, yeah, a little bit of all of that. Um, you know, I think just because um, I've been a teacher for so many years, I, uh, I, I kind of go into them with a lesson plan sort of what I want to do. And um, it will usually start with uh, an introduction. Um, I will, if it's a picture book, I'll read the book and I'll have it projected so they can hear it read and they can follow the images. Um, I, I try and make sure that the kids have always read the book before I read it, because then they know what's going to happen. They're not hearing it to find out what's going to happen. Right. They can actually sort of step back and look at the whole thing and say, okay, what's going on in this picture? Why is this happening now? Um, it, is there some foreshadowing happening here that's going to uh, uh, hint at something to, that's to come later on? Um, then uh, usually something about um, the theme of the book. So if it's, I've done some books that relate to math, we'll have a section about uh, where the, how the math in the book actually works and, and maybe some of the history of that and maybe some games to go along with that. If it's science, uh, science quizzes, I did a series of science books where I got to had the great privilege of, of getting to work with some wonderful scientists and learned so many amazing facts from them. And so taking students through that research process and the things I learned. Uh, and then a little bit about publishing and then usually some uh, demonstration of drawing and design uh, where we'll sort of collaboratively as a group uh, design a new page for one of the books or a new monster or, or and I'll take them through the process of how that works. And then lots of questions. Yeah. So do you want to read a little bit from Don't Eat the Game, your, your just sure. published book? And, um, and then I want to talk about how you did something really creative uh, to do a virtual launch party. So we'll talk about that. But if you want to read a little bit so we get a sense of the story from in your voice, it'd be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. This is Do Not Eat the Game. And uh, the first thing we'll see are these end papers. And the end papers reflect a, um, a board game. And these are the colors that we'll see throughout the book. These are the same patterns that the story is going to follow. And then uh, I don't want to give away the surprise, but these end papers come back in a different way at the end of the book as right. well. And we have, let's see, the title page. And in the title page, we see that the girl is getting this game as a gift and the dog is helping her open it and he's ripping it open which is <laughs> more foreshadowing right what can come later this game is for two or more players it is easy to learn Sorry, I got to get... Yeah, it's a little doing this challenging on Zoom, but you're doing great, Matt. <laughs> it is easy to learn. And we'll bring you hours of fun. And then we sort of follow down here. She's a little dejected. She's starting to put the game away. And then there's a tap at the window. And don't worry. And here's the monster. Anyone can learn to play. It's also a great way to make new friends. These exact um, words will come back again at the end of the book in a different context. Right. And there's the point where the girl is going to invent her own game later in the book, and these same rules are going to be subverted. Carefully take everything out of the box. Read all the rules. Do not throw the pieces. Do not eat the game. 
And of course, here the monster is doing everything that's breaking all the rules. Roll the dice, take turns moving around the board. Every time you land on a square, find a block that matches and add it to your tower. And then the game continues and we can see that more friends show up and they sort of take over and eventually the girl kind of, kind of gets pushed out until they've completely taken over the room and we can hear a dog barking in the distance the dog who left at the beginning of the book. The girl leaves to investigate, and while she's gone, the monsters steal the game and flee out the window. And she is not happy about this and sets up a plan to get her game back. And I won't spoil how she does that, but it involves making a game of her own. That's great. Do not eat the game. Um, so you couldn't have your usual launch in, a, in one of your local independent uh, bookstores, uh, but you created something out of Legos uh, <laughs> that was very clever. First of all, are those your Legos or are those your son's Legos or how do you have all these Legos around the house? Well, they started as my Legos many, many years ago and then they were supplemented uh, with his Legos and now the entire stash of Legos is in our basement. And, and I'm gonna be honest, Paul, this whole thing was just an excuse to get the Legos out. Of course, <laughs> but I've never seen Legos. You somehow created like a, a belt driven sort yeah. of thing. Was, uh, with, I never had Legos like that. Was that your own additional engineering or? Well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an old Lego motor hooked up to some gears, hooked up to this device that very slowly turns. Right. And what I did was attach the camera to the top of it so it would rotate at a steady speed and then um, created a, a virtual book launch party. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> we couldn't see actual people during the book, during the quarantine. Um, I just set it up so uh, I'm having a big party with myself and I appear over and over again right. uh, reading the book and, um, and, uh, and eventually uh, falling asleep reading it. Sure. It, it seems like if you can amuse yourself, it will work. I mean, I think <laughs> childlike imagination is absolutely necessary, probably for a author illustrator. What, what what is it that that what was the spark that came up with that idea, or or, or even for your books, is it observation? Is it kind of digging into your own childhood memories, or I'm I'm sure a lot of it is emotional immaturity. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> perfect. <laughs> um, I, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by um, people, adults, who still have that great creative impulse. Um, my wife, who has helped me with every single book I have ever made, every book I've made is dedicated to her. Um, uh, I, we met in art school, and she's a wow. tremendous illustrator and painter, and uh, my good friend Larry, who I've written several books with, uh, all the faculty that I teach with uh, in the art department ha have this same creative impulse to want to make things just for the joy of making them. Right. And I, I think I'm super fortunate to be on this, uh, to be in this bubble with these people where that we're saying, okay, I'm going to take a day and build this thing out of Legos and stay up all night and set up this elaborate um, this elaborate setup to shoot a 30 second video that who knows how many people are going to see. Um, when I tell these people that, they all say, that sounds like a great idea. There's nobody saying, boy, you're weird. That's, <laughs> look, don't you have better things to do than you're a grown man? Why are you spending your day playing with Legos? Yeah. So living, living in that bubble is, is, I think, a big help as well. The, the joy of it, and you're right, creative people uh, often do things uh, without ulterior motives simply for the joy of creative process. Now, your wife's name, I, I think I saw in your bio, Christy. I don't think I know her. Yep. What kind of right. work does she do? What, does she also a book uh, illustrator? No, no. Uh, we met in art school. She was an art teacher for many years, um, a web designer. Um, she A big part of what she does now is um, she is the 
master organizer of all my author visits. So okay. she deals with all the schools and does all the logistical setups and uh, keeps them on track and helps them order books and everything else. Yeah. Uh, I, there's no way I could do it without her. So you, you say you share a studio with her. Mm -hmm. Is her side cleaner than yours? I mean, can, can you swivel that, uh, that, that camera around to see? There's no way I'm gonna swivel that camera around for you, Paul. That's fine. <laughs> a, a clean desk is a sign of a troubled mind, I think, you know. Um, We're just gonna pretend that it all looks like this and there's nothing <laughs> hiding behind the green screen over there. <laughs> I hope there's no monsters out there. Actually, your monsters are friendly. They don't seem menacing in a way. I mean, they, they don't, they eat things and, and whatever, but I, I can't remember a single board book with, with my son and daughter that wasn't chewed or gnarled. And I think all of our board games were also, you know, had, had chunks out of them. <laughs> right. I mean, kids, I, I, I think it's, I often underestimate how kids will react to even the scary parts of the story. Right. There was, um, I I had it here. I mean, it's okay if children's books have a lot of tape and stuff. I can remember a lot of ours had to be taped up and things. The ones, you know, over and over and over, the bindings would go after, you know. And I can tell you as an author, the absolute best thing, sometimes I'll do a, a, a book signing and someone will come to me and they'll have this beat up version of the book that's taped and stuck together. And they'll be so apologetic and they'll say, I'm so sorry, I wish this was in better shape. And I feel like that's the, the most beautiful compliment that they exactly. could give an author. Juice box stains and maybe, right. you know, other, other uh, things on there. So uh, yeah, that, that means it was put in use. So is your, what's your ultimate goal? I mean, do you want to entertain both, you know, parents and children or, and teachers or what's your ultimate goal with your books? I, I think um, number one, I want to entertain myself. Yeah. Um, I think that's the times that I've, I've tried to write a book to fit a certain, you know, market niche or um, to, to, because I think, oh, this is what will sell right now. Um, those haven't been particularly successful, but the time I've written, times I've written something where it was just for me because it seemed goofy and, and something that I would like, for whatever reason, those seem to, to be the ones that take off. Uh, I would hope that every book um, teaches something. Mm -hmm. That's, I think just the teacher in me wants that, um, some kind of message about, um, about how to live in this world, right? Um, some of the books are about friendship. Some of the books are about uh, fear and confidence some i did a a couple books about a hairy pirate named backbeard uh that are really about just uh being okay with who you are right. um but you know a funny thing about you know that i always get uncomfortable when i when people ask me about the message or the moral of the book right um because i think there's a there can be a presumption that authors um sort of start with a moral that they want to teach and then build a story around it. And so often I don't even realize what the book is about until I'm finished writing it. And I say, oh, I, I thought it was just this silly story about this, but I guess it's really kind of about this. And this is what I was trying to say. And there's a, there's a part deep in there that's, that's guiding those words that the conscious brain maybe isn't even paying attention to in that first couple drafts. Right. And I saw um, also a reference to out of your 18 uh, children's books, over 500,000 copies in print. That must feel amazing. Do you come across your books in libraries and schools and bookstores? How does that feel? It's, it's amazing. Uh, I'll tell you two stories. Um, the, the first one was when um, my first book came out and I was so excited. Um, my, the William K. Sanford Library was my library that, uh, when I was growing up. And uh, as soon as the book came out, I, I couldn't wait to go to that library and see the book on the shelf. That really meant so much. And this was back in the days of card catalogs. So I went and I found my card in the card catalog and then uh, to see it, that it was there. And then I went to the shelf and it wasn't there. And um, 
you know, there was this initial wave of disappointment until it hit me that, oh, it's not there because of all these books in the library. Someone decided this was the one that they wanted to take home that day. And that's an experience that I will never, ever forget. The other one uh, happened with a book I did called The Lion's Share. And this was, uh, this was a book that ended up getting, it's a, it's a book that has a sort of a math theme to it. And I think because of that, it got, um, uh, there were a lot of reprints in different countries. So it's, it's been published all over the world. Uh, there was a Chinese edition, a Japanese, a Korean, a bunch of different ones. I was doing a signing at the Gilderland Library and uh, a family came up, a Chinese family, and they had a copy of the book in Chinese. And what had happened was that they had purchased this book in China and it turned out for whatever reason to be one of their favorite books. And when they moved to the United States, they brought this book with them. And then amazingly just happened to end up near Gilderland and saw that, oh, the author of this book is right here. Let's get him to sign it. And I, I think that is an experience that I will never forget for all of my days. The idea that this book published in a country that I may never go to, uh, in a language that I'll never read, somehow found its way to Gilderland, New York for me to sign. Um, that's crazy. That, that's a beautiful story. I mean, it, it speaks to the power and, and magic of literature and how it can take you to other places. Literally here, it, it, it came across the world. But talk about you're a real hometown person. You worked very close to where you were born. and, and, and <laughs> that, that was not intentional. That was, I mean, I love Albany. And, and the longer I was born uh, in Albany and the longer I've lived in the Capital District, the more I, I am convinced that it's one of the great places on the earth to live. Um, but it's purely coincidence that my office at the college is just 1,500 feet from the building where I was born, which, <laughs> which is, I think, I, as I told you before, is, um, is super depressing. <laughs> I think that's the main have... thing. Yeah, you found your place, man. Um, well, it, I think I do you gotta to get your people. Lego your Lego uh, transporter out there and get you walking from birth to uh, office now. <laughs> I do like to, to clarify to people that it wasn't a straight line, those 1,500 feet. I, I did go other places in between over the years. And, but you live out in the country and live on a farm. Tell, tell us about your sort of daily life. I assume you have to tend to animals and stuff like that. And but yeah, we've got a couple of horses and um, we've got a barn cat and some chickens and, uh, you know, we're, we're pretend farmers. Um, my wife is the real farmer and gardener and she keeps an amazing garden um, and grows all this food for us to eat, which is fantastic, especially at a time when it's hard to get out. Right. Um, and then, you know, working at the college means that I have some flexibility in my time and I'm able to work at home, particularly during the summers, and try and work on new projects then. Yeah. That's um, great. So I have no complaints. I feel absolutely blessed. And and again, you know, living in the capital district, I can work in the middle of Albany and and be out in the country in 15 minutes. Right. So we hope that uh when we have a vaccine and it's safe and healthy, we'll see you in local bookstores and and, uh, and you'll be able to go back into schools. We appreciate being part of this virtual Albany Book Festival. Matthew McGillicott, uh, author, illustrator of 18 books. The new book, which you can order online, we'll have the link, is uh, Do Not Eat the Game. He's also the chair and a professor of art and design at Sage Colleges. And uh, we really appreciate you being with us. Thank you very much, Paul. This was a real honor. And uh, if I could put in one quick plug, yes. I do have a... Um, I do have a, a, a little form on my website. If you purchase Do Not Eat the Game, just fill out this form and I will send you a custom drawing of a monster book plate with your name on it. Um, I was gonna ask about that. That's, that's kind of during the pandemic, it's hard. A lot of people like to get their books signed. So you would do a little illustration sign yep. for anyone that orders your book, okay. Yep. You just go to my website and you'll see it right on there. Um, you just fill out the form and I will put it in the mail to you. Beautiful.
All right, Matt, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Paul. This was an honor. Thanks a lot. So long. This book festival was made possible with the support of the McGuire Family Endowment at the Writers Institute, the University at Albany Foundation, the Office of the President of UAlbany, the Peacott Family Foundation, the Capital District Library Council, Stuyvesant Plaza, Chet and Karen Opalka, Charles Tui and Alice Green, Pernilla Dake, Elizabeth Ruthman, and Betsy Lopez. If you appreciate our programming and would like to support the Writers Institute, you can find out how at nyswritersinstitute.org.